All right, we're going to call this meeting of the school building committee to order. Today is Thursday, May 12, 2022. Uh, the first item on our agenda is the approval of the April 28, 2022 meeting minutes. A motion to approve from Chris McDebo. Is there a second? Steve, I'll get says a second. Uh, are there any corrections um, or clarifications? Seeing none, uh, then all in favor of approving the April 28 minutes, please um, so indicate. Any, oppo any opposed? Aye. Okay, I think, I, I think that's unanimous then. Um, there's no abstentions? Okay. All right, then that brings us to our OPM update. Adam, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you, Randy. Good evening, everyone. So uh, tonight we'll do the standard high level overview of the just general progress. Um, and then uh, I also wanted to touch quickly on just the buffer trees and that initiative since there's been some, some activity in that regard. Um, so overall, uh, again, as with the past weeks and months, heavy emphasis on the exterior envelope, um, spray applied air vapor barrier is complete at the A and B wings of the building. Um, the big development that has occurred uh, is the starting of installation of windows and zinc panels. So along the southwest portion of the building at B wing, um, there are a number of windows that have been installed and uh, in zinc, uh, the zinc panels have been going in. So. Uh, Jeff has been out there, uh, Jeff, the architect team has been out there looking at the detailing and ensuring that what's being installed uh, aligns with the mock-up and the required details for ensuring there's a weather type building. Uh, Becking and the uh, gym is uh, still ongoing. They were putting insulation down on the acoustic deck uh, this morning. And the site contractor is continuing to put all the various pipes in. Um, currently, a lot of storm water and the septic force main going in. Um, we still have a couple more months of building envelope insulation, but uh, you know, with each day, you'll see more and more of that final appearance of the building um, between the metal panels and then um, subsequently the, the EPA wood siding. Um, the interior, uh, the Office A wing has started getting drywall in it. So framing is up and you're starting to put drywall. Uh, painting at the lower level in B is uh, largely been done and has now started up in uh, the upper area of B. And interior framing is ongoing in the gym wing um, in anticipation of the roof being done. So uh, looks like when the roof is, is done, all the framing should be up in that area and they can start moving on to uh, drywall and, and taping and painting. At the intersection, um, the intersection work is, is uh, largely complete. I think there's one small electrical component that needs to still arrive, but for all intents and purposes, the intersection is done for the purposes of the desk, uh, for vehicular traffic. Um, in the coming week, uh, the key meeting that's coming up is the abatement and demolition plan uh, meeting with the actual subcontractor. And the, the point of that meeting is to identify what their work plan is, how much staffing they're having, uh, and basically working through that schedule and process to ensure that there aren't any issues and to identify the schedule as we ramp up into move out from the old building and demolishing the old building. One item that did come up just this morning is, uh, is just a point of with regard to procurement is that we're still got to keep sharp on identifying any issues with potential procurement delays. So Newfield identified that there was a there was an issue with the original walk-in cooler for the kitchen that the original manufacturer said wouldn't be available for a number of months. Um, Newfield does have a, an alternative manufacturer that they believe can get it within the required time. So it doesn't appear at least initially that that'll be an issue, but just case in point, these issues still continue to arise in this market environment. So uh, one of the items that Newfield is developing is their, what's, what's left in terms of procurement items. And that will be uh, submitted, I believe, is it tomorrow, Al, correct me if I'm wrong? 
that that's when that's going to be um, submitted to the town and we'll have that for review to help try to project out any other potential issues with procurement. Any, uh, any questions on that before I move into some of the tree items? Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, as of our last meeting, the mock-up hadn't been completed. So did that get completed and we're okay with the way the windows and the is being installed? Jeff, I'll let you take that one. Jeff, did you hear that question? Yeah, he's muted though. Okay, how about now? Yeah, Let's do this. If I can share my screen here, I'll walk you through what the plan of attack here is, is for all these things. It'll be a part of my architectural update. So let me share my screen. Let's go this one. Let me know if you guys can see it. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the question is specifically about the, the, the mock-up and the installation of the, the siding and the windows. I don't know if you have, you want to maybe save the bulk of your uh, report for um, just a bit later, but do you, do you have uh, something to show on that? For the, for the mock-up? Yeah. And yeah, basically, and basically what we've done then is, uh, I'll stop the share. What we've done is um, uh, approved the zinc component of the mock-up and the thing that was crucial for me is to get the counter flashing in there with the lip so that it receives that third cock joint they got that done they're installing it on the building it looks good so i'm, I'm confident that's going to be done right we also looked at the window installation the curtain wall installation on that south side and i pulled the team together both the curtain wall guy and the uh, zinc guy and we walked through all the details that i expect to get out of them so i think there was some confusion but now they're all on the same page so I think they're ready to roll. And I, the, I told the zinc guy that he's the guy that needs to finesse and be the artist here because the curtain walls cannot change. They have to be plumb and level. And then given the uh, variances in the rough opening, which aren't major so far, um, that they are able then to tweak the, um, the clip and the angle of the zinc so they are able to get a straight line then. So once they understood that that's the process, which should have been part of the mock-up and I, we all discussed that that's what the mock-up is for, the tool before we get on the building. So in order to meet the schedule and make sure things are done accordingly, then we have to have me go out there and walk these guys through the details on the actual building and make sure that it's gonna be done right. So I think we're on the same page and I think it's it's rolling, but the mock-up is still not finished in my point. And if it's not to be finished and they're gonna abandon it, then I'm gonna expect a credit for that piece of the pie. So right. that's... Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, question yep. from, Chris, from Chris. Chris, I think you mean. Um, yeah, Jeff, can you just clarify the term curtain wall? Is that, I had the expectation that was only larger walls of windows. But well, that's, it, that's a generic, that's, yeah, that's a generic term, but um, a curtain wall uh, window glazing system is basically a solid extrusion uh, where there is a uh, double glazed or triple glazed uh, argon filled uh, piece of glass that fits in the outer part of that solid extrusion. A storefront system, which is what we have on the inside, is made of separate pieces. It's a little bit less expensive than the curtain wall, but I always make sure I try to get as much curtain wall on the outside of the building because it's a solid extrusion and there's no way that they could ever leak if it's done right. If, if I may, Jeff, really quick, curtain wall um, also has greater uh, spanning capabilities than storefront. Storefront's typically limited to about 10 feet in height. Uh, so if you have any vertical openings that are higher, you have to go to store uh, curtain wall. So basically in the curtain wall, the uh, frame is actually structure. Is that right? Versus simply having a, a wall, uh, a batch of windows like you in a house. The, the, both curtain wall and storefront can have um, horizontal load capability. I mean, they're both appropriate for an exterior application. Typically, um, as Jeff stated, you know, curtain wall is, is, is probably a better, more appropriate, especially for a net zero building. But it also, um, once you get over a certain height in windows, and I think you've got some spans that are two stories, curtain wall cannot achieve that and you have, or storefront cannot achieve that and you have to go to curtain wall. 
Thank you both. Oh, I think we got a model here. I've got a curtain wall here. Ah. You see that, Chris? Yeah, we can see it. So this is the solid extrusion, right? The glazing is in this, in this plane. So this is all one extrusion. So that's not made of pieces. Storefront system, this is made of pieces. Got it. Okay. Hey, Jeff. Yep. Okay. Any other questions for uh, the information so far? Okay. Then, Adam, I guess you can continue. Yep. Um, so, I wanted to give an update on the buffer between the school property and the adjacent neighbors. So in terms of just uh, timeline and, and schedule, the option two tree replacement that the committee approved a number of weeks back, uh, the trees are, are ready and uh, they should be delivered to the site either tomorrow or Monday. There was some back and forth with regard to when the actual delivery and installation will start. Um, right now, and the for the, for the past couple of days, the uh, site contractor has been moving some of the brush out of the way. So as part of the shared committee folder packet, there were some photos that I had taken a while back of the existing conditions that sparked some of the concern from the neighbors with regard to, you know, it wasn't looking very pretty to say the least. Um, I did take some photos today, which I'll share here. just to kind of show the progress that's been made from the site contractor. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the debris has been moved away in order to make the, new, uh, the new trees. Um, I did speak with a neighbor yesterday um, who indicated that, you know, there was definitely progress was being made and that was, that was noted and appreciated. Um, there are still some items left. Um, so as I get scroll through the photos here, you can see there's still a lot of this driftwood looking material, um, but the overarching timeline is that the, the, the buffer trees will be replaced here uh, starting next week. Um, I also wanted to just share the plan if I could. Uh, let's pull that up. One of the concerns that uh, the two end neighbors shared was with regard to replacement of um, white pines along the property lines because their properties were so exposed. So I spoke with the landscape architect and what they indicated they could do is they could not change the number of trees, but just locate some of them differently. So that way there would be the spruces along those property lines and shifting the white pines farther in towards the, towards the building. So uh, unless the, the committee has exception to that, that was something that the uh, landscape architect said that they could easily do to help accommodate some of the concerns of the neighboring properties. I can't resist asking, are they gonna charge us more for that change? No, no, it's uh, basically the, the landscape contractor is putting in stakes today and tomorrow of where trees will go. And what the landscape architect will do as part of their services is go out and confirm those locations. And then when, as they do that, they'll just say, that stake there, that's a spruce, not a pine. And then that's the end of it. So same number of trees, same species. It's just uh, you put A here and B there or B there and A there. So that's, there should be no cost there. Chris McNamara, we have a question. Yeah, I kind of, after I saw those pictures of the neighbors, I really uh, felt like we missed the boat with um, not putting in more trees um, and, you know, we had talked about being good neighbors, and I think those photos accurately showed just how exposed those yards are, and I'm disappointed that we didn't uh, vote for more trees there. The thing I will, will say is after, uh, the, after the committee vote, there was the next meeting um, where I had um, asked if there was a desire to Asked this committee if there was a desire to do something additional. And so as a next step from that effort, uh, I spoke again with the landscape architect about what might make sense. And um, she agreed that for 
the purposes of this planting, it, it might make sense to just get the plantings in, see what's there, and then scale any additional effort to what's needed. Um, so for example, there might make, it might make sense to be, to put in a privacy fence if the goal is just for screening rather than to try to litter in a bunch of expensive trees that might not, you know, might not take, you know, sometimes things don't make it through the winter. Uh, they might not provide screening for a number of years, um, or they might, that might be the answer. But point being is we have this, the first step is ongoing, and then there's always the opportunity to add additional, whether it be thuyas, you know, arborvitae, or whether it be a privacy hedge or an outright fence, those are actually options that could be explored um, once we sort of get the lay of the land of what it looks like, both from the school looking outward, at, which is intended to be a natural buffer forest, and from the neighbors looking inward and the, and the, and the relationship between the two properties. Okay, uh, Tony next, and then Kathy. Um, is there any concern about children leaving the school property? In a way, I'm thinking that a fence somewhere might not be a bad idea if you have kids who are bolting. And this is a question that really needs to go to Kelly or Peter or somebody who, who knows more about how kids perform and the schools are expected to perform than I do. Now, we don't have any fencing now. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't think that's our practice is to enclose the school grounds. So, um, although we are certainly closer to homes than we are currently with our schools. I don't know, Peter, if you have a thought on this. Uh, thank you, Kelly. I, I agree. Uh, it, we don't have it now. Uh, it, it really is in our practice. And sometimes fences create uh, a false sense of security. Um, kids that elope or, or are runners, so to speak. Fortunately, we don't have many. Uh, but there are some kids that have that challenge. Um, and um, uh, we're well aware of those uh, and and have other means to do that. And so I, I just I think the scope of the fencing that would actually do the trick is is fairly immense and with low return. Kids can kids can climb pretty quickly when they when they want to. So I I would hate to see any sizable fence um, uh, in place. The, the fencing that was a very, very high level talked about might have been closer to the property lines as part of the, the screening effort rather than a corralling students on the playground effort. If that was my thought, that, but I wondered whether there was any concern since the land back right up onto private, onto homes, whether it would make some sense. Kathy? Uh, Adam, I just want to thank you very much for being so attentive to this. I think not just now, but going forward, uh, really listening and validating our neighbors' concerns is really, really important. And I hope you continue to do that. And I just want to say I greatly appreciate it. It's, uh, it's really important. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Chris Kiefer. I just want to echo what Kathy said. I felt exactly the same when I read the uh, materials, so thank you, Adam. Okay. More, more to come. <laughs> There's nothing else on that. That's what I had for the OPM update. I'll come back on when we're at the PCOs and all those. Okay, then uh, see no questions. We'll turn this over to Jeff for his architect update. Yeah, can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, so this is as of today and the mock-up is just transformed into the full building. So this is what we were talking about uh, this morning. So the standing seam to the right here with the protective co cover over it uh, is going up and it's looking pretty good. They're not to remove this protective coating until they're done with the, with the wall. Uh, they did so here because they're pretty much finished and they're gonna start to wrap this standing seam into this flat lock seam here. So we were discussing where the caulk line ends and where the mullion 
continues up. So I think the zinc is going to look really good. It's it's uh, it's going to weather and it's going to stay sort of a light gray. And uh, that's as of this morning. Let's see if we have any other pictures here. So Jeff, just as clarification, that protective wrapping on to the right, that's on that's over zinc. Yes. There is some zinc around the corner as well. Yes, they just didn't finish this part. They're they're working this whole this whole B wing is zinc. It'll be two different systems though. There's a flat lock system which is here, and there's the standing seam system here, and that's to give a variety of textures uh, on the wall as we move around the building. Let's see if they've got any other pictures here. Jeff, while you're pulling that up, um, I actually meant to ask this months ago, and I mean, it's not going to, we're, we're obviously siding the building the way we're going to side it, so I, I'm just curious, with the ball fields there, how, how dent resistant is the zinc? Well, on that side, I believe we have, uh, we do have some zinc on the A-wing uh, that's far west, that's pretty much where the trailer is on the other side of the trailer, but the front of the building is the Ipe. It's all okay. the wood that Everything is, uh, yeah, that's a, like a three quarter inch uh, solid Ipe uh, okay. plank system. Got it. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to bring your attention to is I know that my site observation slash field reports come out and everybody kind of freaks out. So I wanted to show you what we discussed in the trailer again with Newfield and Colliers. Um, I thought would be a great idea is to start having them send me photos in response to what I'm catching. So say in this case, there was some damaged foundation. So here's a photo of that same foundation where they have repaired it, okay? So then I go to the site and I double check that that's actually the location that has been done correctly. So uh, moving on, the uh, blocking issue here where I raise the flag with the uh, sheathing not having a place to be attached to on this vertical section near the foundation here, which I saw that was a red flag because we needed to have the envelope tight. So they have gone in and started to place those things in there, right? So those things I can start to take off my field report once I am convinced that they have made every corrective action that is gonna be approved by our office, okay? Uh, I can probably take this off because I checked them. They're all level and plumb now, the trestle tree supports. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a heads up of, of how we're proceeding with, uh, with the fixes with new fields. So things like this, they're still working on this, little minor things, but they got to make sure that they send me a picture that shows that it's been corrected. So other than that, it's just... Uh, Check in, double check in, taking a lot of photos, taking dimensions, trying to find as much as I can, and then bring it to the attention of Newfield. And so far, that seems like they have been proactive to correct the things that I'm finding. So to put everybody at ease, it happens, you know. And uh, it's just it's it's a good thing that it's being caught now. Just like you're going to hear later, a couple of PRs that are going to come forward, and we caught them. There's some money associated with them, but Thank God we caught him. And that's all I have for the architectural report. Questions for Jeff? I've got a question, Jeff. You say, you know, thank God we caught him. Have, have you not caught some that you've caught, frankly, afterwards? Have I not caught some? You say, thank God we caught him. Have you actually caught all of the fly balls? I'm hoping so. All the ones that I that stand out that I that I um, have raised flags that I think are major concerns, um, I believe I have. Now I'm not there 24 hours, um, and I don't know if they've taken out those supports. I'm being told that they have for those rails, and it's in here that they just basically wrote a comment that they took them out. I don't have a picture of it but I do have a large magnet I can bring to the site and put it on the sheetrock to see if it is still in there. So there are always ways to find out if they are doing what they need to do. Okay. So, I'm wondering about the unknown knowns that are unknown. 
Okay. Uh, seeing no additional questions, then we'll have our contractor update. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to share a screen. I'll go through some photos first. Can everyone see the photo on the screen? Yes, we can. So this is a, um, a view of the gym and the high roof area. Uh, they're doing the roof um, on the gym right now. Um, it's supposed to be uh, complete by tomorrow, as well as the high roof area as well. They're doing the, the blocking right now on the high roof to get that prepared for roofing tomorrow. Any roofing that's not done, they'll come in Saturday to finish, but we will be watertight by the end of the weekend. We started the uh, retaining wall at the south side of the building. This has the stairs at the slope area uh, where it transitions from the two story to the one story. And this is where all your play area will be. Sidewalks are around the site, they come up the stairs and then Go, go around the building. This is a shot of um, a B wing. This is uh, the siding panels going up on the uh, east side. The zinc over here will be uh, EPE, and then zinc will continue around this, this wing. Um, They've been installing all the insulated panels in B. They're just about done. We got the smoke test or fog test in A today on the vapor barrier. So they will be, once they're done with B uh, insulated panels, they'll be moving to A and uh, the process will continue over there. This is a nice roof, roof shot of the gym area, the B area and the high roof. Anything that's blue is EPE, anything that's black is zinc. So our next focus is uh, getting the walls, the exterior walls of the gym ready uh, for siding. This is a shot of A-wing that now the vapor barrier is complete. We'll start the panels, the insulated panels on the south side and work our way around. We have all the window frames for this area as well. This is the pump house, the roof is on now, the hatch getting ready to pour the, uh, we're backfilling the tank now with P-Stone uh, that gets a traffic pad on top of it and the generator and uh, dumpster area, we're getting ready to pour that. Uh, the concrete retaining wall, has been poured, it needs to be rubbed to get a finished appearance. And the modular retaining wall uh, is complete. This is where the fence post will be installed along the edge. There's six foot chain link fence around the retaining wall. And then from this point around the back, it's four feet, four foot chain link. It's another shot of that pump house. Another shot of the rear retaining wall. You can see where it's a little sparse back here. This is the work area for the buffer trees. They've gone in and put the extra layer of uh, silt fence in the back just to protect the from soil runoff. This is a shot of the buffer planting area. One of the shots, this is another shot. This is the uh, south retaining wall where they're finishing up the uh, lower portion of the walls now. Just out of the pump house. Kind of scale this back a little. Pump house roof. This is a shot of the, uh, the siding and the window frame install. The glass for the windows should be on site within a couple of weeks. And we can finally get the building closed in, 
and uh, start installing some millwork. It's a shot of the gym roof area. It's the library, right? The skylights. Where the skylights are, yeah. Yep, this is the library with the roof, with the gym roof over here. Yep. These are the insulated panels they're installing. Once once they put the panels on, they put this waterproofing membrane over the panels just to keep them dry. So it's proceeding pretty well. There's actually two crews installing panels. This is the second crew, and they're working on this elevation. And then there's another crew with uh, metal. Uh, zinc panels that are working this elevation. Uh, and then there's another crew that will be doing the EPE siding. These are the uh, Z-Gerts for the uh, EPE. These get installed wherever there's blue, this will get installed right across. And then there's furring that's, that gets installed uh, uh, vertically. Uh, it gets these these get insulation between the Z girts and then the uh, the EPE siding goes over mounts to the the horizontal fern. This is the east uh, side of the south B wing, where they're coming across with the uh, vertical panels, and another crew is doing the window openings for window frames. We got the switch gear delivered last week uh, and it's being installed right now. Um, the uh, secondary cabling is being cut right now at Sullivan Benson's uh, shop. It'll be delivered uh, Monday and uh, we should be ready for uh, Mike to inspect it probably mid midweek next week. Once we get the inspection from Mike, the approval, uh, it takes about a month to get permanent power. So it's kind of critical that we have the permanent power by you know mid June, in order to uh, demo the the old school. So critical activity. This is the uh, vapor barrier in A wing, which completed uh, in the past two weeks. The contractor carpenter contractor today started framing out the individual. These are individual uh, window units in the admin area. All the um, punch windows are all on site with the glazing. So once these openings are ready, we can throw all these windows in. This is the high roof area at the, uh, at the main entry. And we've had uh, the carpenter close in all the clear story windows to uh, to keep the rain out. But once so once we get the roof on, we'll be pretty pretty dried in. We'll be able to get rid of all this other plastic down below. This is the gymnasium. The, the uh, mason has been in here uh, for the past week. Uh, he's about as far as he can go until uh, we get the roof on and we can insulate and drywall these this framing back here. This is the main area uh, of A. Um, and this is the progress they've made in the past two weeks. They've got pretty much everything framed out. Uh, a lot of the electrical has been roughed in. Uh, a lot of overhead piping. Uh, all the, all the uh, roof leaders are tied in um, and they're working on plumbing and bathrooms and uh, sinks in the uh, classrooms. Another shot of area A, Maine. This is area B, Maine. They're going through now and uh, doing their final coats on the uh, drywall. So I would expect the next time we see the next meeting we have, this should all be painted out. You can also see these strips on the ceiling. This is for the wood ceilings that will be installed once we get a more, control, a more controlled environment. Another shot of B main. 
that is all for photos. Okay, a lot more photos than we used to see as, yeah. as we love our progress. Uh, Chris, you have a question? You better hand up for a while. Yeah, um, Al, back to the, uh, thanks. Yeah, so Zerini said, thanks for the many photos and poses. Um, but back to one of the very first things you said about the fog test um, on A. Can you speak to that? I mean, who, and maybe um, Adam too, who kind of looks over whose shoulder and, and does CMTA get involved and how did it turn out? And just more more information, more background on that, please. Sure. The, uh, well, the fog test is performed by BVH, who's a third party inspector. He doesn't work for us. Um, his interest is, you know, to the project, not to us. Um, he, they do a pretty thorough job. Um, there's certain items that um, aren't 100% complete yet, like the eaves, where the uh, the AVB and the roof have to have to meet. So those areas still need to be complete, and he has to do follow-up testing there. But for the most part, the walls themselves are are good to be, uh, so we can proceed. Um, so it's it's a pretty good uh, pretty good. Uh, Test to do to make sure that you're you're get a fairly tight building. Do you end up finding places that you did not know you needed to address? Oh sure, yeah. Yeah, the 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 BVH rep came into the trailer just at the at the end of the, the site meeting today and indicated there was a. Um, between the first fog test and this fog test that just occurred this morning and afternoon, uh, there was you know, a rapid improvement in some of the issues that were found in the first fog test and then now have been rectified as part of subsequent work. Um, and then there's new issues that were identified that they're writing up in their report, which the fog test just happened today, so we don't have that yet. But um, new issues identified with new configurations and that were part of building part of A as opposed to in B. So there's definitely value that's going on. But yes, to answer your, your question, Chris, yes, they work for us, uh, us being the town and, uh, or you being the town rather. And um, CES helps monitor their testing protocol as part of that. CES is the commissioning agent. Yes, I'm sorry, yes, the commissioning agent who also works for the town. Thank you. Uh, Steve? Yeah, a couple of quick questions. Um, where in those photos, is it possible to see the opening you're going to leave for the DOAS unit to come in? Like, do we understand where that's going to be? Oh, yeah, I can I can show you that. Let me get back there. Let's show it again. Okay, so let me get to a section that I I can find it. Okay. So uh, this is the, the gymnasium here. These are the, there's two large curtain walls that go. It's a library. Oh, I mean the library. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, they um, two large curtain walls uh, face north. They yeah, face the ball field. So we're going to leave this curtain wall out. Um, we were thinking of uh, we we could make it through this main entry, but we've got this. Uh, we've got the bus canopy which as soon as we get uh, uh, the siding and windows done in A, we're gonna start building that bus canopy. So we, don't, we won't be able to make it through here because the bus canopy is a little smaller. So we're gonna leave this curtain wall out. We're gonna come in through the building here. They have a very large door here, a nine foot door we'll be able to get through. We're gonna wheel it down the hallway, which is no problem. We have, um, there's a, the first, um, classroom on the right hand side uh, does not have a corridor wall because we've been open to the elements. So we're not going to frame that. We're going to bring the unit into the first classroom. We're going to come over to the corridor wall. We do have to do a little bit of demolition at one of uh, below one of the uh, window frames um, to get the unit through. And then we're, it comes right into the um, the mechanical room so it's there's a lot of stuff that we'll, ha we'll, we'll have to do after the unit goes in to you know to make sure everything's 100 but 
Um, a lot of it, it's not like this unit here. The, the only extra, extra cost we have is, is putting some, a little bit of framing and poly here to keep it watertight. It's not like we're taking out the storefront to get it in. We're, we'll just put the storefront in at a later date. So we're, we're kind of like delaying some of the costs. So it's not really that, that much of an expense. So by doing it that way, we still have a, a watertight environment for the inside finishing materials we're putting in, like the millwork and the sheetrock and all that kind of stuff? Yes, correct. Okay. And then I think it's uh, two slides after this one, number eight or nine. Um, it shows the, uh, yeah, that one right there. Now, where that um, metal box is right there, is that about where the trike area is going to be? Yeah, this is the buffer trees here. Your, I think your bice loop, uh, trike loop is up here. Got and this, it. Okay. And this, yeah, because this flattens out. This is the, the incline, and then this all flattens out. So the bike loop is up here. So that silt fencing is not on the property lines. It'll be moved back when they do the trike area? That's correct. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then do we have an update on the electrical fixtures? Or, I'm sorry, the light fixtures. I know we had 80% on the way. And we not sure about the other 20 and what was coming and what wasn't. Um, yeah, um, I went through the entire uh, shipment. Um, they are putting in light fixtures now in the bathrooms because we have hard ceilings there. So we're trying to get the hard ceilings uh, uh, ready for inspection so we can finish this, the drywall on the ceilings and possibly start ceramic tile in those bathrooms. Um, what we're missing uh, what we don't have ship dates for yet is the um, the fixtures in the classroom, the hanging fixtures or long linear fixtures. Um, but we have a meeting tomorrow with um, Sullivan Benson, our mechanical electrical contractor. So we're hoping to get an update at that time. So the, the 20 percent that we don't have are the ones for the classrooms? Yeah, we're missing the classroom fixtures and we're missing, uh, there's a recessed fixture that goes in the uh, bathrooms. It's actually recessed into the drywall ceiling. It's a, it's a linear fixture that gets recessed. We don't have those. Those are the two uh, fixtures that we don't have. We're missing some exit signs too, but those are not that critical. Uh, so it's basically the classroom and the gang bathrooms. But we have the majority, there's other lights in the gang bathrooms. They have a, a it's a type E fixture, it's a recessed can. Um, so we're putting in those now so we can complete like 95% of the ceilings, you know, and then leave a space out so we can get that, that recessed fixture in once it comes. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions for Al? Okay, then thank you, Al. You're welcome. All right, that brings us to the, the PCOs. Yes, uh, so first I'll bring up a few items that were uh, subject to expedited approval with the subcommittee, um, Randy, Ryan, Kelly, and Kathy. Um, the first one was a construction change directive. Uh, this was for demolishing and abandoning the remaining portion of the concession stand septic leaching field. So if you recall, there were two PCOs that were previously approved by this committee for the septic field that was in a different spot than the survey showed for the concession stand. Um, as part of cleaning up the rest of the work, the Department of Health indicated that the remaining portion of the septic fields, the septic leaching fields needed to be either demolished or abandoned in place or removed as part of the requirements. Uh, TSKB and, and Colliers understood that that was part of the original scope that was requested um, from Newfield. Uh, Newfield indicated that that scope was not captured in their change order. So uh, there's a disagreement about whether or not there should be a, a change order. Uh, however, the scope itself is not in disagreement. It's a requirement from the, from the health department. So uh, that was why a construction change directive was issued in order to obligate the work to proceed while the discussion of 
who owns the cost is being resolved. So that was one item. A, another item was a potential change order for uh, window and door decals for room numbers that emergency services could see from the exterior. So they pull up and they can see which room numbers correspond to which windows and which doors. Uh, the original bid documents did include some window decals, but they did not have the size that was required and requested by the emergency services department and the location needed to change. Um, so this change order was uh, passed to reflect the increased size of the lettering, as well as the install location at the tops of windows. Uh, and this one needed to go early to procure some of the sticker materials uh, to get them moving. And then finally, uh, there was a potential change order for the relocation of the fire department connection, um, whose work needed to, the work needed to happen more rapidly. Um, effectively, this change order was to change the fire department connection from a wall mounted unit to a standalone standpipe in front of the building. Um, there was a, a, a conflict between some of the piping and the library walls. Um, and additionally, the location of the fire department connection out in front of the building on a standpipe um, would be more accessible. So that was what uh, this change order was for. Um, so there's no action needed on any of these. They've already been approved, but circling back with the school building, building committee because they were approved under the expedited process. Um, any questions on these before I move to the, the change orders for tonight? I just have a quick question about the, what was the original cost of the decals? Like how much, uh, anyway, what was the original cost for paying another $4,000 or something? For larger ones, yeah, the original cost of the decals, Al. If you were, uh, if you want to jump in, I believe it was it was less than a hundred dollars or something because they weren't specified as to what size. Is that right, Al? Uh, I'll have to pull up the change order here, or I can just pull up the log and find that out. So the larger decals, the material cost in and of itself wasn't. The bulk of the four thousand. It was the labor to install them at the tops of windows versus the bottom of windows. So if you're at the bottom of the window, someone can just go along inside the rooms and put stickers on. But if they have to take the time to go up on top of a ten foot window and install them, it takes longer for that person to go around and do it. Um, in addition, I believe doors did not were not included as part of the bid package. So there's the addition of doors that need to be put throughout the building. Adam, do you have the number of that change order? The PCO number? Uh, yes, I do. 48. Yeah, the original amount was around six hundred and fifty dollars. Awesome. Mostly labor, two 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 days worth of labor. Thank you. I should have been on it. Okay. Uh, is there anything else on those before I move to the ones for tonight? Let's let me share my screen again. Um, so for tonight, uh, the first item up is PCO 74. Um, this is for framing at exterior walls to allow the electrical rough in. Uh, this is at the corner classrooms. Uh, Jeff, you want to take it away? Yeah, uh, and we beat this one down quite a bit. So um, basically, it all started with uh, Tony, the electrician, wondering how he can get conduits up into that exterior wall, given that there's a, a structural beam and some brace framing there. So um, we went round and round discussing how to angle up through the slab to get into the wall. And then, long story short, 
we needed to pad that out slightly to get his conduits up for the interactive display panels and a few other outlets that are in there. Um, and it's just in those two classrooms, I believe the end classrooms there, they had to add some additional furring to make sure that they weren't gonna just be exposed uh, in the floor. Actually, they can't do that anyway. So it's a routing issue, coordination issue. Um, it's one of those things where we, you know, we caught it in a discussion, we figured out how to map it out. And that was the best way to map this conduit run out. So, and this thing was much higher and we, we beat it down because I made the argument that the stud framing was supposed to be eight inch and they put in six inch, they hedged it to the outside. So the first layer of furring, they didn't include in this. So we got that basically for nothing. It's the outer layer of furring that they had to add on that was disputable. And we went round and round and we came together with this number. Chris? Jeff, you said uh, two classrooms. Do you, you literally mean one, two classrooms or do you mean two classrooms in every wing? No, just two classrooms, the end classrooms. Correct, Al? That's correct. Yeah. The end classrooms, is that an A wing? B. B wing. Okay. Thanks. Okay, uh, any other questions? Um, is there a motion to approve PCO 74 um, for the amount of $3,149.05 for additional wall framing to allow the rough in? Uh, Chris Magdabo. And is there a second? Steve, seconds, thank you. Uh, any further discussion or questions? Then all in favor of approving PCO 74, please indicate. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, thank you. Hey, okay, next item is PCO 69R. This is uh, $407. It's infill masonry at the stair. Uh, Jeff, this was for the, the heating unit, correct? Yeah, evidently the uh, building inspector came through and saw the hole and was wondering if there was any way to protect it at the last core of the masonry. So we decided to fill that in and make it surface mounted uh, to uh, you know, appease, appease the building inspector. I mean, it was one of those things where we could have fought, we could have exhausted this thing, but the priorities were in other areas. It's in the stairwell, it's not in the path of egress, it's $400 infill it, mount the, the fully exposed uh, heating unit over the top of that uh, uh, infill, and then we're done. So this, this, was a, uh, this was a heating unit that's in the stairs. It was intended to be recessed. The building official said it could not be recessed due to fire rating, and so they have to be surface mounted. But because this was the first one, some of the, the masonry was damaged. So this is to replace the damaged masonry. Yeah, I think his concern was when we cut the hole in the masonry, uh, we're just left with the last face of the masonry uh, and that the masonry, since it has cores in it, wasn't grounded full. So he didn't want anything to potentially pass up through the, through the cores, which, you know, we have to listen to him. We have to do it. So um, it's done. Any questions? If not, is there a motion to approve PCO 69R for the amount of $407.17 to infill masonry for the in stairwell one? Chris McNamara, thank you. Is there a second? Kathy, uh, any last comments, questions? Then all in favor of the motion, please indicate. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Aye. Aye, Tony in favor? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. The last PCO for tonight is 66R2. Uh, this is for 26,000 for revised door hardware specifications. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this one. This one was a miss. Uh, there was a final version of the hardware spec that didn't make the bid set. So uh, it was caught, we caught it. 
Uh, we did make sure that uh, the exterior doors, the interior doors, uh, any electrical issues, everything else was covered in this uh, PCO. And we found out that Sullivan Benson has not going to charge us anything for the electrical changes and the interior doors from builders. There's no additional cost for any of those changes. So this is basically dealing with, the, correct me if I'm wrong, Al, all the exterior uh, window system uh, doors, power, et cetera. And that what, what the issue was with there is items that dealt with uh, Jamie wanting card readers for his IT classrooms that didn't make it or his IT uh, workrooms. Uh, there were things like um, uh, uh, power to certain doors that weren't covered that needed to have power. Miscellaneous things throughout uh, all the doors that were in the project. Just there was one last pass that didn't make it. So I have no other excuse. It happens, we caught it. Um, I know I keep saying that. Um, and this one's a hard one for me to discuss, but we're gonna get it done right. Tony? When when you say it didn't make it, could you clarify what it didn't make? Well, there was one final version of this hardware package um, that the, the, our hardware consultant over there at ASA Abloy had sent an email to, not me, to some other people, and um, it didn't make it in the final bid package when it went out to bid. And it was caught during the round and round back and forth with the hardware. I kept marking them up, sending them back with my hardware consultant. The things were, weren't right. They weren't right. And then they weren't changing the things to meet our last revision. So that's when it was uncovered that they never had the last revision. Uh, so that's what happened. OK. Uh, is there a motion to approve PCO 66R for the amount of $26,254.40? revised or hardware. Uh, Rich, thank you. And then second, Chris, thank you. Uh, any last comments, questions? Then all in favor of the motion, please indicate. Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, all right. <clears throat> That's the last of the new field potential change orders. There is another change order uh, for $2,085 for the uh, well, phase one fell, phase one well drilling contractor um, that Scott's going to talk about here. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, this, this preceded Adam's tenure with us. This was back when we had Felicia on the job. Um, but, you know, as you recall, we had a phase one um, drilling contract that drilled two potable wells and two geothermal wells. There was a number of testing involved in it. Um, and that was approved back in, I think, November of 2020. Um, the original bid um, in bid form um, included a number of unit costs and, and other things. The original uh, bid in the purchase order was issued, was issued, as you can see on the, on the top line, original contract sum of $82,150. And then, for example, there's, there's a number of, there was a number of credits involved, um, you know, listed, uh, for example, item 10, drilled 590 feet, not 730, deduct 1960. There were, there were unit costs, and we assumed some depths of drilling and other things that, uh, so there were some credits involved in this and some ads involved as well. But this was never captured as a change order when they submitted their first application for payment. So they submitted an application for payment for 84,235, which is, is the number on the very bottom there. Uh, but right now, currently, the purchase order still uh, with the town right now only reflects 82,150. So what we need to do is to go back and approve a change order for the Delta, all the credits, and then the ads, which were all done by the unit costs within their bid, um, and, and add $2,085. We didn't catch this initially because there's a 5% retainage. And at the time, there was still a $125 um, document report that we were waiting for. So their, their initial application uh, was only for $79,900. So it was still below the 82. Uh, so that didn't show up as a red flag uh, in the budget uh, summaries. Uh, 
Um, but we, uh, Adam and I were going through things and we were, we were looking at this contract saying, hey, they haven't gotten us a final bill. We need to start you know, looking at closing this out. Let's get their, their uh, consent of surety and release of liens. And then we identified that um, the application they had submitted had exceeded the initial purchase order. So uh, what we're requesting tonight is that you approve change order one for the um, well phase one well package uh, in the total amount of $2,085. Okay. Does that make sense? Anybody have a question? And is there I'm a motion? To it. Okay, a motion to approve the change order one dated 5-10-2020. 22, sorry, for Connecticut Wells Geothermal Services, the amount of $2,085 for phase one well drilling services. And I think I heard Chris Kuefner say a motion to approve. Is there a second? Uh, Rich, thank you. Um, then uh, any last comments, questions? Then all in favor, uh, please indicate. Aye. Aye. Any opposed Aye. or abstentions? Okay. Gets us through that. Then that brings us to the opportunity for public input. Seeing no one here uh, from the public, uh, we will move on then. Um, that brings us to an executive session. Is there someone that would like to make a motion to move into executive session pursuant to Connecticut General Statute 1 206E and 1 210B24 for discussions of contract revisions due to project delays? Uh, Mary's. Uh, for the motion and second for Madison. Uh, with that, then we will move into executive session and we will invite in um, our owner's project uh, managers, Scott and Adam and Ryan Aylesworth and Kelly Lyman and Peter Dart. And did Tasha, okay, there's Tasha. Tasha. Um, yes. So uh, you will stop the recording. Okay, the committee has met in executive session. There is no action to be taken uh, today. Um, so with that, I would accept the motion to adjourn. I so move. Thank you, Chris Kiefner and second, uh, Mary. Uh, then all in favor of adjournment, you can say goodbye and we'll see you next time. Great. Thank you everyone. Randy, thanks very much.